Today here with us is the Honorable James Collins, a judge of the Superior Court now, but formerly judge of the Philadelphia Municipal Court. Judge Collins, thank you for being here and assisting us in preserving the rich history of the Philadelphia Municipal Court. Thank you for inviting me, Tom, and it's great to see you again. Good seeing you, Judge. Let's go back to your beginnings. Why don't you tell us about where you were born, your parents. Tell us about your parents and your siblings. I was born uh, in Alney. Uh, we moved to uh, Bustleton at age four. Uh, a lot of people don't know this because they're like surprised. Uh, neither of my parents were born in this country. My mother was born in Newfoundland uh, when it was a British territory, a British province. Mm -hmm. It says on her papers, a British citizen. And my father was actually born in uh, Greece, in Smyrna. Uh, my grandfather's name had been Demetrius Kolonidis, which is James Collins, and uh, oddly enough. And this is topical as of this time. Uh, he was, my father was smuggled out, allegedly, uh, strapped to the legs of an Orthodox priest under his skirt when there had been a, uh, there was first the Greek genocide and then the Armenian genocide in uh, <clears throat> 1913, and this all becomes relevant now because of what's going on in uh, Syria and Turkey and the fears of the Kurds and uh, there was a Greek genocide, there was an Armenian genocide and, uh, and I personally am very worried that there might be a Kurdish genocide but this is not a show in international politics no, so I'll stop that, talking. That's amazing, that's amazing. So you grew up in the Alni section, did you have any siblings? My sister Julie who is three years older, she presently lives in Lansdale. Uh, <clears throat> I am extremely unusual, uh, I think, although I don't know much about the demographics. I was born and have lived in Philadelphia all my life except for uh, brief periods in the military. Right. But I am a native Philadelphian. That's wonderful. And where did you go to high school? I went to high school at Northeast High School. Uh, Cotman and Algon, and I had a good time in high school. Okay. And uh, What sort of activities were you involved in? Oh, I think too many, but I will say this, I'm bragging. I was the captain of the football team. I love football. I also, they had a golf team then, and believe me, public league golf was not that great. I was not that great a golfer, but uh, we had fun, and I was in... I was the president of the junior class, president of the senior class. It was High school was a wonderful experience for me, and I feel sorry for many of the children in Philadelphia who, through no fault of their own, are not getting the opportunity, A, educationally, uh, socially, or culturally, that I had. And I don't mean to criticize the president, uh, the present superintendent of schools because believe me it's a tough job right and they don't give him any money to do what he has to do understood understood so from northeast high school then where did you go to college i was very fortunate i got accepted into the university of pennsylvania i went to penn my father was very insistent that i uh, live on campus because uh, he could not afford uh, to live on campus. My father, by the way, uh, went to Harvard. He was uh, very fortunate. Uh, but I think like then, like now, my father was also a very, very good basketball player. And I mm -hmm. think that had something to do with him getting into Harvard. He was an A student. So I, uh, he wanted me to live. So I was fortunate enough to live down at Penn for okay. all four years, and then I kept my apartment 
uh, my first and second year of law school, I went to Villanova Law School. Okay, so you were at Penn. What activities were you involved in there? Uh, <clears throat> I'd say too many. I did everything except go to classes, uh, <laughs> which is still my regret to this day because there were some great professors and I should have been imparted more knowledge. I was involved, um, this will show you how old I am, I was involved in men's student government. They had a men's student government then and a woman's student government. I was a member of the Sigma Chi fraternity. I uh, played freshman football and I uh, stopped playing my sophomore year. I am in student government, the fraternal activities. So I was a member of an organization called Kite and Key, whose duty was to promote Penn and a lot of other various activities. It was a wonderful spot to go to school. And again, I'm very lucky to have gone there. So from there, you go to Villanova Law School. Um, tell us about that experience. Villanova Law School was a completely different experience for me, uh, and I don't mean this in any pejorative sense. It was a parochial school. Mm -hmm. uh, there were, first off, there were only 104 people in my first year class, and okay. only four of whom were women. That's a statistic I think uh, right. is difficult to rationalize with. We had a crusty old contracts professor that required everyone to wear, except the women, to wear a jacket and tie to his contracts class. Uh, it was a very traditional form of education. It was large lecture halls, you know, the uh, Socratic method, calling people on for questioning about the cases you were supposed to have read. and. Uh, it was an outstanding educational opportunity. There have been two, I think, I'll have to call them scandals within the last 10 years that really hurt the school's reputation. When I went, it was a top 40 law school. I don't know if it'll get back to that now, but I was just out there, beautiful campus, fabulous faculty, and they really care about what they're doing. I'm not going to give them any more commercials here. <laughs> so you graduate from Villanova Law School, you pass the bar, and what's next? Uh, <clears throat> I had been fortunate enough to get a job uh, between second and third year law school as an intern in the DA's office. I went to work in the DA's office, but I had been in, I was an ROTC, I was commissioned a second lieutenant when I graduated. This is from law school? Uh, no, from, from a Penn. Pen. The Army was very good to me. They gave me a uh, deferment to go to the first year of law school, and then a deferment for the second and the third, and then a deferment to take the bar exam. And then I had a, I guess it was, I still had to report. I had a six or seven month hiatus and that's when I started in the DA's office. Six or seven month break and uh, hiatus, I had to go to what's known, uh, still known as the U.S. Army Infantry School, Fort Benning, Georgia, which by the way, was the most difficult school I ever went to. Is that right? Yes, academically and of course physically, the infantry officer you had to have some semblance of physical condition and it was I went and I arrived <clears throat> by infantry school standards when I went there I was an old man the uh, Vietnam War was just uh, being we were being phased out of Vietnam I originally had orders to report to headquarters, headquarters company, 9th Infantry Division, Fort Lewis, Washington, which was a cannon fodder division. Uh, it was all ROTC officers and mostly draftees. It, and uh, I had orders to report 
And shortly before my graduation, I got a letter from the, I can remember it almost word by word, it said, Dear First Lieutenant Collins, due to President Nixon's Vietnamization program, you will, comma, unfortunately, comma, not be allowed to serve your full year, full two-year commitment. They told me uh, when I left Fort Benning, I would have to get into a reserve unit and serve in the reserves, which I did. But uh, I often think what would have happened uh, had I not received that letter from the Secretary of Defense. So this is important, though. And I had been, when I was in the, or I had been in the DA's office for six months. And we were taking, you know, you know I was a, as Judge Go, Emil Goldhaber once said, I was a mere A, B, C, D area, and I just took guilty pleas and stuff, you know, cleanup work. And uh, there was a little block at the lower left corner of the letter from the Secretary of the Army, and it said, if you desire to appeal this decision, check below. And I checked, I wave, and all I could think of is all those guilty pleas I had been taken and the colloquy, and do you wave your right? I have, I had some of these clients were so happy, some of the defendants at the deal that right. I gave them, me in the office, and they'd scream, I'll waver, I'll waver. And I checked that block, and all I could think of is, I'll waver, I'll waver. But the Army, I served for six years in reserves. It was a very, very positive experience, and I can tell you the Army was very, very good to me and for me. That's great. So you were in the reserves while you were working in the DA's office? Yes. So you do the internship, you take the bar exam, and then you start with, uh, and that was uh, Arlen Specters. Arlen Specters, yes. Was the district yes. attorney. And I was a uh, assistant DA, I guess, for four and a half years. Emmett Fitzpatrick had been elected. I just decided that it was time to move on. Okay. Uh, and I wasn't going to be a career DA. Arlen was a great DA. I think Emmett was a very great good DA and he had a he just had he had difficulty with the press mm -hmm. largely due to his own doing and uh, he just so what sort of things did you do in the district attorney's office I was so fortunate first I started out in family court di division okay and I was doing the hearings oh god preliminary hearings on child sexual abuse matters, which was extremely depressing. Mm -hmm. uh, then I did the usual stuff you do in family court, and then I went over to municipal court, and I was fortunate. I had a great boss, Victor Danubli, okay. Judge Victor Danubli, uh, whom I uh, spoke to, you know, I think Victor is no longer a senior judge, and I spoke to him about uh, several months ago, and he's in great shape, still as funny and witty as ever. And then my next, then uh, I was in the uh, felony waiver division, and Jim Fitzgerald, Justice Fitzgerald, uh, on the Superior Court, who's now mandatorily retired, he was my next boss. I was very lucky. In the interim, I tried a few homicide cases uh, because in those days, in July, and things were a little more helter-skelter than mm -hmm. in the court system. And they'd come in and they'd say, well, judge somebody says this case has to start Monday morning and it's Friday afternoon, and you're the only one in the office, so here's the <laughs> file. And it, it, it was a knee-wobbling experience, but again, a wonderful experience. So when do you leave the DA's office? I left the DA's office, I was, uh, say it was four and I left in, I think, October of 1975. Okay. I went into private practice with two fellows I'd gone to law school with. Uh, 
I think the way the world is now, you probably couldn't do that. I think we were fools to do it then. But one of the, and we had this partnership, Glickman, Dranoff, and Collins. One of the, uh, Arnie Dranoff has become a very successful attorney. He's still a successful plaintiff's attorney. The other, Bob Glickman, whom I had gone to high school with and hadn't seen him for four years until I met him on the first day of Villanova Law School. It's one of these mm -hmm. Philadelphia's the world's largest small town stories. Bob became uh, an industrialist. He, he practiced, we practiced law for a while, but he went into business and has done very well financially. Okay. Much more so than I. <laughs> so what sort of practice did you have? When you start out then, you had to take a little bit of everything. Right. And of course, I was, I was going to, I was going to say paying the bills with criminal appointments, but I really wasn't paying the bills, <laughs> so I can tell you. So I, uh, but you remember you and I had one big criminal appointment together. We did. Uh, we, we sat together, how long was that, three, three and a half months? About four months, yes. The original MOVE trial, yeah. I represented Delbert Africa, but again, during that time or shortly after that time, I was very lucky uh, a friend I knew from college had become general counsel at a large corporation, a large credit corporation, commercial credit. The economy tanked. Mm -hmm. There was massive inflation because we had to pay for the Vietnam War. We spent borrowed money on that. We, meaning the United States of America, had to pay for the Vietnam War. And so the, they had a lot of foreclosures. I got, and repossessions, and again, he called me, my friend, and asked me, retained me for what they thought was a dead end collection matter, a ship that they had financed and all its kind of in, it was, it was docked up in the Delaware River and they wanted to seize the ship. And what occurred was, again, blind luck, Tom, blind luck. Mm -hmm. I seized the ship, I then was the attorney on the writ, and it was, you know, I didn't, bankruptcy court and repossession matter, you basically own it. And at that time, out of the, out of nowhere, I got a call from another attorney who said uh, he was representing a, I think a German power company. The coal that was on the ship was high sulfur coal, based not worth much here, but he wanted to know if I could sell it to him, I said, well, you have to, have, you know, just sure, there's the amount on the debt, there's this, there's that. And, and I figured he'd haggle and I'd have to call my client. He said, no, we'll pay that. <laughs> and so I called, uh, I'll use your name because I don't think, Westinghouse Credit and told them that I was going to get every penny plus interest plus attorney's fees back on this what I thought what they gave it to me because it was a worthless note okay. and so people in the home office thought suddenly I was a star how, how did he do that <laughs> I didn't want to really tell them and so I got some business from then so I developed somewhat of a successful practice and I was always doing also at the same time doing plaintiff's work now during this time did you ever think about becoming a judge I had thought in law school. You read those cases and I would say to myself, pardon my lack of humility, but I would say, I can do a better job than that. I know I can do it. Uh, this guy's a bum. I, you know, I can do a better job. So I, uh, yes, and then fortunately uh, I had been active in politics. I've been active in uh, Rendell's campaign for DA 
and he called me and asked me if I would be interested in becoming a municipal court judge. I really wasn't, because mm -hmm. at that point, I had just started to make money. Right. My starting salary in the DA's office was 11000 a year. I had just started to make money, but Rendell being as uh, manipulative and pushy and convincing, it was convinced me to take the appointment. It was a good deal because Governor Thornburg was appointing, uh, was going to appoint two Republicans and two Democrats. He was letting the party name them, but the parties had to have, the, these individuals had to go through his Merit Selection Commission, the head of which was a gentleman named E. Barkley Kale. And I was probably more nervous at that interview than any other interview in my life. This is, uh, you know, we're going way back now. We're right. going back till uh, uh, 79, 80. Right. And we used to, there used to be a term in Philadelphia, a white shoe law firm. And there were these gentlemen at the big law firms and they wore white shoes in the summertime, which I do now. And, and they had stiff starch collar and I'm sitting in front of them. And I was nervous. And, and some, I guess I was less nervous than many of the other candidates. And, uh, and the deal was, of course, uh, Governor Thornburg he let the parties pick their two candidates. You'd cross indoors, and each county chairman had to commit to cross endorsing. And, and at that time, Bill Green Jr. was mayor, and uh, of course, uh, Osman was chairman of the Republican Party, and they could deliver. So I was lucky. I didn't have much primary opposition. I got elected to the municipal court. And you're elected, um, and tell us about your tenure on the municipal court. I was first appointed, and I was sworn in, I remember this very well, on June 10th, 1980, and I ran that fall, no, ran in 81, and was elected to a six-year term, mm -hmm. and I guess... I sort of had gotten drunk with power or heady on campaigning, actually liked campaigning, and it was very unusual then. Three vacancies came up on Commonwealth Court, and you could cross endorse. I didn't win the Republican primary, but I, I won the Democratic primary, I think. Well, it was so close, it wasn't declared official until September. So uh, then I got elected to Commonwealth Court, but I loved municipal court. And tell us about your time on municipal court. Do um, you remember where, what divisions you served in? And I don't think we even had divisions then. you got to remember there are no bail commissioners then. Right. So we would have to sit down at the Roundhouse, and that was sort of uh, the midnight to eight at right. the Roundhouse was the nadir of my existence, uh, setting bails, trying to control the uh, drunks in the gallery who were looking down, and uh, at the Roundhouse, and I just, oh, and that would always occur that I would get a call. I don't even know if they still have this rule in criminal procedure. You have to be arraigned within so many hours speedy of arrest. Speedy trial rule. Speedy trial. Arraigned within so many hours of arrest. That's speedy trial. Yeah, but, or else they couldn't use your confession. Exactly. And I lived, of all the municipal court judges, I lived the closest oh, okay. to the roundhouse. So I would continually get calls, and I mean, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, Thanksgiving, Easter, and I would get a call, hello, this is Detective X. I remember it one Easter Sunday, my entire family, my parents, my in-laws, <laughs> slicing a ham, 
and I get a call from, uh, I forget the detective's name, it's a homicide. We're at the roundhouse. We have taken a statement and, yeah, for, I'm sorry, I forget the number of the rule. Uh, the time expires in 20 minutes. Right. And I said, I don't know if I can get down there in 20 minutes. And the detective said, Judge, I knew you'd say yes. And if you go out of your front door, there is a cruiser there waiting for you to take you for the roundhouse. So, so I didn't. Even, I don't know where my robe was. So I, you know, they left me off at the front door, hastened me through, and I got down to the courtroom. And I think we arraigned that individual about five minutes before the. Uh, was it Rule 236? I can't I'm remember. I'm not sure the rule. I think the case was Davenport, and it was a six-hour uh, okay. to arraignment. But, uh, yeah, the, yeah, I remember well, it well. We got through that. So, uh, And I, I love municipal court. Mm -hmm. People don't understand, and I guess I shouldn't say this, but if you've ever watched the show, and it's off, and, and, and unfortunately the star, Harry, is dead. Night Court. Yes. And we would be in, our night courts were held in room 195 or 196 City Hall. That TV show is very accurate. The individuals with the antennas made of aluminum foil stuck in the air that were communicating with the mothership and stuff like that. We weren't overladen with security. There was no budget at right. that time. We'd have one court officer uh, and one one sheriff, one big sheriff. And a lot of pro se litigants. Pro se litigants. And at that point, the Philadelphia Municipal Court was the busiest court in the country. It had more cases than any other court in the country. And I think there were only 19 or 20 of us as judges. The trial commissioners did such a fabulous job moving things through. And we were well run, well managed. And I'd like to think we did a great job, but. Well, I know you did. Uh, but before we conclude, there's one question I have to ask you, and that's uh, a notice of your many, many accomplishments and awards. Uh, you became a fellow of the Philadelphia College of Physicians. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, like everything else in life, uh, personal contacts are what matters. I had written several opinions on MCARE and on uh, professional liability, and also that the state uh, prison system had to do a better job with providing medical care to the inmates. And a good friend of mine had become the president of the Philadelphia College of Physicians, and he decided they, they should exclude the membership by honoring people <clears throat> who had achieved things in life that only were peripherally affected their membership. And he nominated me, and somehow the board uh, approved me. And it's a lovely certificate, and it's on my wall. And when you first look at it, you think I went to medical school, but I didn't. Uh, I'm still afraid of blood. And uh, I felt that was a very great honor. The president then was Dr. George Wolreich, and I think he still is the president. He's now the somebody, somebody endowed professor of medicine. But that was a good thing. Yeah, well, I want to thank you, Judge Collins, for thank you being here with us today and, and giving us. Time has Your flown. History. Time, Time has flown, and I think you've been far too modest. You, I'm sorry I are, talk so much. No, but you've earned, and obviously your career uh, has been one of a stellar performance, both in the law, 
I mean, as a practicing attorney and as a judge. Thank and you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you.